excited. So my name is Marissa. I'm one of the student directors of the Healthcare Symposium, and I will be introducing. Sorry, let me move this in. No, okay. I'm going to be introducing Dr. Anastasia Lukaidu Suderes. She is a professor of urban planning at UCLA, associate provost for academic planning, um, and she's also the dean of the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. Associate Dean. Associate Dean, sorry. <laughs> um, so her specialization is urban design, physical and land use planning, with degrees in architecture and urban planning. She has published extensively on issues of inner city revitalization, gentrification, displacement, cultural uses of public space, mobility, and safety. Her research focuses on the public environment of the city, its physical representation, social meaning, and its impact on residents. With her colleagues at UC Berkeley and UCLA, she has initiated the Urban Displacement Project, which aims to understand the nature of gentrification and displacement in American cities and help communities take effective action. Join me in welcoming Dr. Lukaidu Sideris. Um, good morning, everyone. Let's see, how many of you are from uh, the public health community? Okay, so most of people are not. So as, as Marisa said, my background is in design and planning, but a good part of planning, thankfully, is really interested in, in healthy cities. How can we use design and policy of the law to create healthier environments? And so what I'm going to discuss today is about a particular project that uh, deals with gentrification. But let me start from, um, from the beginning. So, and actually you heard a little bit in the introduction, imagine a neighborhood where the houses start getting painted, you see trees, you see bike lanes, uh, you see new coffee shops, uh, people in the neighborhood can walk, new markets, fresh food. So what is wrong with this picture? Actually, a number of uh, public health officials would tout these amenities as important improvements that may encourage walking, may encourage a less sedentary um, lifestyle, may encourage consumption of healthier foods. Now, the problem is that, oops, let me see, because the clicker, oh, it's frozen. <laughs> we tried it before. Uh, this doesn't work. Doesn't this work. Doesn't work. I have a lot of uh, images and maps to show you and pictures, so we're very much relying on that. Here we go. Oh, here we go. Okay, okay perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the problem is that, and that's a kind of a, a new coffee shop that has replaced a small mom and pop store in Los Angeles inner city. The problem is that such neighborhood upscaling is often hard to disentangle from processes of public and private investment that may drive up, drive up the land values, they may drive up the housing costs. And so I call this the dark side of neighborhood upscaling because it may lead to gentrification and even worse, displacement. So as you heard actually this morning, uh, gentrification is a neighborhood change where typically a historically disinvested neighborhood, often working class, often minority neighborhood, is transformed by higher income residents and sometimes higher, uh, a more upscale commercial establishment. It was noticed first in the 1960s when uh, sociologist Ruth Glass from the UK started seeing in some of these inner city neighborhoods things changing and you know this neighborhood upscaling happening and she coined this term that is now very widely used. So gentrification basically involves flows of capital and people into the neighborhood. And the most widely known type of gentrification is residential, where we see a different mix of residents coming into the picture, into the neighborhood, but it can also be commercial and also can be cultural. When a number of artifacts, establishments that you have associated with the neighborhood you live, that you have grown up, start disappearing and a whole different set of artifacts uh, start appearing. And I would even say that it is to some extent a global phenomenon. You can find gentrification in Latin America, you can find in Asia, in uh, China, in, in Turkey, definitely in the UK, and of course in the US. 
And um, economists would tell you that this often happens with neighborhoods that they say uh, they have an end gap, a difference between a potential uh, rent that the landlord can realize because of the market and an actual rent. And it happens in, in capitalist economies, right? So in the US, we actually have experienced, uh, since we started noticing gentrification, four waves of gentrification. The first wave was from the 60s to 1970s when what was called the federal bulldozer, basically um, federal investment and urban renewal that wiped out whole neighborhoods of lower income halls, homes, often minority neighborhoods, and replaced them most of the times with office and commercial buildings and some upscale housing. We then see the second wave, the 1980s, which is mostly private sector uh, driven, initiates redevelopment in some selected central city neighborhoods and first ring suburbs. The third wave is in the 1990s, where we start seeing large scale public private partnerships that's, that bring particular investments. This is the time that a lot of cities start developing metro rail projects. And remember this, because I'll, I'll tell you how it plays out in, in California and in Los Angeles. Um, so uh, transit investments, as we found out, the number of station areas start getting higher values and we start seeing gentrification. That's the time that we see public housing developments. You heard in the introduction about Jordan Downs and how the housing authority really tries to create more upscale units. Well, there is a whole federal program, HOPE 6, that try to do nationwide exactly that, to really um, renovate units in most cases, sell them to tenants. But the problem is that the tenants that could afford were really the wealthiest of the tenants, and most of the people were displaced. So what is probably the most important consequence of gentrification is displacement, when households are forced to move out, but also maybe prevented to, from moving into a neighborhood because of conditions that are beyond their control. And it can occur in different types of neighborhoods. It can be physical, when, for example, your building is raised down. It can be economic, when you cannot afford the rent. And it can be exclusionary. What this means is that you want to buy or rent into the neighborhood, but you cannot because the prices went up. So it is, it is definitely evictions, but it is not just evictions. It is not just involuntary, and it is not always about existing neighborhood uh, residents. It can be about potential residents. And we don't have time to go into all of these, but these are many of the different causes of displacement. can range from abandonment, as it has happened in a number of houses in let's say, Detroit and shrinking cities. Uh, it can be redlining. It can be because of uh, natural disaster. It can be because of a development of a, you know, an airport expansion or a historic area designation that brings up the prices. Okay? And you people will tell you, yes, but there are winners and there are benefits to gentrification. And of course, there are winners, uh, especially people who uh, own the property. Some of them may be low income. I mean, you may be able to finally get, uh, pay off your mortgage and own your home, and then you, you do get benefits from gentrification. Um, but of course, the losers are those who are renters, mostly. So the benefits from gentrification are, as you also heard in the introduction, better neighborhood services and amenities, elimination of food deserts, Deconcentration of poverty, theoretically at least, that you know you have for a period of time a mixture of people, um, increased safety, increased walkability, more integrated uh, neighborhoods. But there are also um, negatives. Uh, there are also uh, negative impacts, and these are a de decrease in housing affordability. Uh, a number of people start feeling social loss and alienation because the neighborhood starts resembling something completely different and they lose a lot of their neighbors. Friction sometimes between old and new neighbors, uh, discrimination and exclusion, displacement. And what is the focus of this conference? Health disparities. And actually, the picture on the right is from protests in Boyle Heights. 
Um, and it is really also the main effect of reducing social equity and social justice. And this is from data from the 2015 American Community Survey in the top 21 metropolitan areas that you will see that the movers, the people that were forced to move out of a neighborhood, uh, they were the, the proportion of low income people of color who were movers was always higher than their proportion in the population. And here is also comparing from 2005 to 2015 the reasons that people said they moved. And you see that the other housing reason, which is usually code for being displaced, not always, but quite often, has quite a dramatic increase between 2005 and 2015. In contrast, um, if you see somewhere in the middle where it says wanted to own home and not rent, that's why I left, it becomes much smaller in 2015, indicating less ability of people to be able to own their homes because of increasing prices. And this is in the 21 largest metropolitan areas. But let's talk about health impacts a bit. I have to say that, again, planners were not quick to realize the health impacts. Uh, we're very familiar with the sociodemographic, economic, and built environment impacts of gentrification and displacement. And I would say that the health impacts, I, I speculate, uh, were not, uh, they are not as much studied yet, although I'll tell you a few empirical studies that I know of, because they are sometimes more difficult to isolate and track. I mean, we have difficulty identifying there's no database that counts displacement. We have no idea where the displaced people go. So it's difficult to survey. Uh, and oftentimes, as you know, as health professionals, it is difficult to isolate and say that I'm suffering from this because of that. There are many other factors. And so it does require longitudinal, longitudinal studies, etc. So the phenomenon is relatively new. But we do know that place has significant impacts on physical and mental health and well-being. And also, the CDC, um, so a few years ago, acknowledged that displacement has many health implications that contribute to disparities among special populations, including the poor women, children, the elderly, and members of racial, ethnic, minority groups. Stress, mental health, disruption of social networks. And we now started seeing empirical studies that talk about the health impact. So for example, a study published in 2014 by Huyn and Morocco found that African-American women in gentrified New York City neighborhoods experienced higher adverse effects on preterm births than white women in the same neighborhoods. A study by Desmond and Kimbrough published in 2015, you see all quite recent studies, found out that evicted mothers were more likely to suffer from depression and report adverse health effects in the first few years after they were kicked out for them and their children. Um, another study published in 2007 found links between hypertension and gentrification. So what can we do about that? I'm going to tell you as a planning pro professional, not a health professional, what we can do uh, and what we have been doing. So um, with colleagues at UCLA and Berkeley, we started the Urban Displacement Project, which is a research and action initiative that aims to understand the nature of gentrification in California, both the Bay Area and Southern California, but also focuses on creating tools, including early warning signs, um, to help communities identify the pressure surrounding them and take more effective action. Oops, this doesn't show well, but any Oops, oh yeah, it does. So, um, so we really tried to map where different types of things, bad things are happening in terms of, of displacement. And we first started by identifying what we called the vulnerable tracks. And throughout both areas, but I'm going to concentrate on the Los Angeles area. So we really identify using census uh, data the tracks that had lowering a population, people who had less than a bachelor's degree, 
uh, below the county median, uh, trucks that have renters above the county median, and trucks that have non-wide population above the county median. And we defined these as vulnerable to gentrification. And then we looked 10 years later, in 2010, and then 2017, 16, and we saw how many of these gentrified, and we defined as gentrified those that have moved to all the vulnerable ones. Have looked, we looked at the same indicators, and if they have gone above the county average, we consider them as uh, having gentrified. Just quickly, a few of the numbers. There were over 2,200 census tracts in Los Angeles. Uh, they were a little bit over 900 that were eligible for gentrification. And depending on, because we looked for 99 to 2000, and then 2000 to 2003, um, you see that uh, about 9%, I'm giving you very rough numbers, gentrified. So we have about 9% and pretty similar in the Bay Area, the percentage was similar you will say, well, this is not a huge number. It is not, but these are very dense uh, census tracts. And even if one family is displaced, this is a matter of, of concern. Um, so here uh, is where you see where these tracts are and which, which uh, census tracts have gentrified. The green are the metro lines. Do you see any pattern? A lot of these are near stations, a lot of which really led us to a next stage to try to find out if there is indeed a statistical relationship uh, between having a station in your census tract and the risk of gentrification. And sure enough, and after a lot of modeling, etc., we did find that that's the case. We looked into all 80 metro rail stations, all of them had experienced important transit investment. And this is important because the planning department really tries to concentrate most of the new development around transit stations. So that's where the bulk of development in Los Angeles County is happening. So if there is this dark side of, gender, you know, of, of this development, we really need to know and we need to try to prevent it. So we used quantitative methodology, I don't have time to do that. We did a lot of case studies. Um, these are the case studies. The first six were for residential primarily gentrification. The last two were for commercial gentrification. We did what we call ground truthing, walking the neighborhoods, interviewing community-based organizations, public agencies, realtors, residents. We did field observations. This is Boiler Heights, the new station. We looked into the local Craigslist ads. Here's from Craigslist. Uh, 490 square feet of a casita in Bohe, Boiler Heights. You see the branding immediately. <laughs> Costs 1,600 per month. That's, you know. Uh, this is a real Craigs, uh, Craigslist ad. So we learned a lot. Um, very quickly, some of, the, uh, some of the findings, we found that definitely if the census tract had a station, chances you had a higher risk that your neighborhood was going to gentrify. Um, on average, station neighborhoods experienced greater increases in white college educated, higher income households. Increases in rents were higher in station neighborhoods. Um, the city council became very interested. This is uh, District 2 that the council member wanted me to create to see where the pressures are. And you see that the pressures are at the border mostly of the district with District 1, which is downtown. Um, we really looked into changes in affordable housing between 2000 and 2013. Station neighborhoods experienced higher losses of affordable rental units and Section 8 housing more condo conversions than non-station neighborhoods. These were particularly acute trends in downtown LA, and I would add downtown Long Beach. Um, and the people who were moving in the neighborhoods were less low income and more higher income, uh, more white population moving in, as I mentioned. Uh, 
So a lot of that is actually repeats what, I, what I've already mentioned. Uh, and we definitely found a powerful, what planners call TOD, transit oriented development effect on the loss of affordable housing. So this brings me to the last part of my talk, which I have five minutes, the importance of anti-displacement policies in station neighborhoods. And we have policies that range from law to planning, that range from short-term building by building to long-term citywide and regional. They do require political will, they do require activism, but a number of uh, municipalities are instigating these policies. If I were to uh, define them in three broad categories, I would say they are tenure protection and support policies. They are to preserve and build more affordable housing units. And there are policies to stabilize neighborhoods and promote diversity. And again, we can, I can spend a couple of hours explaining each one of them, but the point here is that there are these policies and some municipalities have enacted them. Sometimes they are in the books and they're not doing much about them and that's where the political will and the pressure needs to happen. Um, some policies are more towards leveraging the market uh, and try to get concessions from developers. For example, if you give more higher density, you allow a developer to build more than in return the developer can has to build more affordable units. This is one policy that leverages the market. And there are policies that try to leverage public investment, such as, for example, creating a land trust or a housing uh, trust that the city of Los Angeles said they're going to do and gather money, um, which is more of a public sector initiative. Some of these policies gear more towards generating units. Some of these policies try to generate funds. Everything's good, I mean. And lastly, I, I'm going to say that uh, we also have policies that try to prevent versus policies that respond. Because what we found is that there are different stages of gentrification, so um, different policies would work better in different neighborhoods. And I want to finish by saying that in conclusion, the bad news is that our neighborhoods are under considerable stress because of gentrification and displacement. And we know that this stress is likely to have adverse health impacts for individuals and their families. The good news is that we have tools to prevent the negative effects of gentrification, or if it happens, to respond with some remedies but there needs to be a political will. There needs to be civic engagement, as Clarice was mentioning. And of course, as any health professional would tell you, prevention is a much more preferable strategy than treatment. And I think this very much applies not only to the medical diseases, but to the city diseases. So we better prevent and not see the bad effects of displacement that try to remedy. So I think we're, I was asked to finish at 10.35, and we are at 10.35. Can we take questions? Or? Okay, perfect. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> this may mean two things. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering if there's any tracking of like uh, loss of um, important public um, like amenities uh, from, you know, loss of hospitals, for instance, uh, which in, in this case is happening in Chinatown. Um, we lost a 150-year-old hospital um, and uh, what they become to um, also like have redefinition of food deserts, for instance, um, because a lot of gentrified areas tends to will have new grocery stores come in, but the grocery stores are never affordable for the community or like uh, places like loss of laundry mats, right? Like these places where um, low-income community uh, need in order to keep clean and things like that or like bed bugs, infestate, uh, uh, infestation type of thing? Yes. This is a good question. And I, I have to say that the bulk of the studies really have focused on residential gentrification, trying to identify how many 
affordable units were lost, how many Section 8 units were lost, etc. We started recently a study on commercial gentrification, which, as far as I know, is the first study that really tried to identify what is being lost. But I think you are raising a very good point, because when you are talking about the neighborhood, it's not only the homes, it's all these supportive services. It's hospitals, it's grocery stores, and you're also right that where, you know, I, I, I presented a talk a few months ago to um, the community in South LA, and someone said, well, you know, a few, a decade ago, we were fighting to bring investment in our neighborhoods because we did have a food desert. But now, mm -hmm. we, you know, we, the investment is coming, we cannot afford it. So right. that's, that's the big dilemma. And so, um, you know, what, what you're raising is exactly the crux of the problem, that we do want neighborhood upscale, we do want these amenities, but how can we keep the existing residents intact? How can we keep people, and that's why these policies come in that some of them, you know, one of the rent stabilization, that your rent is not going to increase. Uh, I mean, there are other, there is 20, 25, we're starting a project that the California Endowment is, is uh, supporting to really look into all these different policies that are in the books in different cities. So Los Angeles has nine policies in the book to see how effective they have been in preserving affordability. Yes. Hi. Oh, is that me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering, just in terms of your project, you know, I had noticed some of the things or the things that you had listed in terms of the negative consequences for the losers. But one of the things that I didn't see, and I was wondering if your project had been looking at was like the increase in police presence or like gang injunctions and and if so why it was or why you don't include it or if you do include it in the larger project because obviously other yeah. uh, organizations have kind of looked at that and and what that you know does in terms of incarceration no, that's, rates that's, and that's that's a very good point we have not included i mean it is a huge study i mean i'm not saying this to uh defend the weakness it is it is a you know we have not really looked into how the gentrified neighborhood, what it means in terms of policing. That's a good point. I mean, it could be a future study, and thank you for bringing it up. Yes. Um, so I've been hearing a lot about the preservation of low-income and Section 8 housing and stuff, but for the communities that have already lost that, have there been any uh, policies or efforts into reestablishing low-income uh, housing and Section 8 housing for a lot of these people that have already been displaced? Um, not in any consistent way. Where the hope is and the pressure is, and there are frankly quite a lot of groups in the city that are working towards that, is that as you see more development happening and this transit-oriented development, uh, you probably saw coming from, uh, I forget the number, there is a proposed bill, for example, which is quite controversial, to increase density near transit stations quite significantly as long as there are affordable units given back. But the devil is on the details, and, you know, uh, they haven't specified how many units, how it fits different neighborhoods and all that, uh, but, but the effort of producing more affordable housing is usually when <laughs> There is, developers want to build in an area and want, there is competition for uh, building in an area, then the city can come in and say, okay, we can allow you to build an extra floor or some, increase your density, but you have to give 20% of the units as affordable housing, as a way to reestablish. But I would say that so far, um, we are more, uh, we are quite, I mean, the balance is towards losing rather than gaining. Uh, and a colleague of mine, Paul Long, looked into the rents and how they have changed in the last uh, 10 years, and he found out that the increase in the rents of low-income housing were proportionately much higher than in the highest quartile of the more expensive housing. So the rents are increasing in everywhere, but in proportion, they increase more in the lower income neighborhoods because some of the middle class people are pushed into the lower income. So there is this, you know, 
with displacement happening. Yes. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. My question is about investment alternatives. So one of the anti-displacement strategies could be to not do an investment in metro rail altogether and look about look into what that money could be invested into instead. For example, rapid bus transit. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a huge amount of debate somewhere in the 1990s from the transportation planning um, <coughs> scholars about alternative investments, a lot of them, and some here at UCLA were very much indicating that building of a metro favors again more higher income folks. Uh, but this was not uh, heard of, and so the investment keeps happening. Actually, I was reading yesterday, LA Times, that said that Metro is losing ridership. The Metro Rail has lost quite. So there is these debates are um, coming up again. But but the thing is that already there is billions of dollars that have been invested. I mean, you cannot disestablish the system. So what now the response has to be is if we now know that there is more gentrification around these stations, you know, in, instigate the policies that do not allow this to happen. You cannot stop the, I mean, it is, you have created this investment now. I mean, this game is over. It, it, it has been decided for uh, the Los Angeles region. And so it's, um, you know, it's better now to, what I was talking about prevention and treatment, in this case, we have to do the treatment. Yes. Okay. So we had to talk, kind of talked about like having when this development happens, having the affordable housing, having like a certain like requirement percentage wise. But you also kind of mentioned how, for example, markets become more like inaffordable for people who typically live in that neighborhood. Are there any dual policies that kind of tackle this, ensuring that affordable housing is secure and also other costs of living such as food? Yeah. Um, in terms of housing uh there are again i don't we don't have time but i can show you all these policies they do some so for example there are policies that pre a lot of the loss in affordable housing was for condo so, so owners of apartment housing which were generally more lower income started converting them into condos which target a more higher income population so there are some cities that have policies that really prevent this conversion or put a number of terms um, there are the rent control, rent stabilization policies. There are tenant protection, tenant counseling policies. There are some cities that, very few, that uh, they do not allow loss of, they, they call one-to-one -one replacement. So if one development comes in and let's say erases and demolishes affordable housing, 20 affordable housing units, it, there can be a policy that they have to replace with 20 affordable housing units. So there are all these different variations of policies. The problem is that a lot of these, there are a lot of people that are against these policies, and it, it comes up to the policymakers and the politicians, and uh, usually the will is not that strong. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Have you looked at the disparities in um, so there's some communities along the line or in within the intersections that or neighborhoods that haven't seen or haven't been highlighted or it hasn't seen like the combined um, factors? Have you looked at the differences between the neighborhoods that have been gentrified and those that haven't along the rail and maybe and yes. Yes, we saw, I mean, what we found a very important difference, frankly, was community activism. So that tells you a lot. Yeah. Because we did, and actually we tried for the commercial one, we tried to kind of have a control group of neighborhoods that are on the same line, pretty close to one another, and one has experienced 
significant commercial gentrification and the other has not. And, you know, there was quite a lot of agitation. Yes. Well, I, I think that building low-income housing, I know that has been oftentimes done by nonprofits that they have to um, cobble together different, because there have been a number of grants for low-income housing, but these need to be cobbled together. And uh, one of the aspects that needs to be improved is the streamlining of exactly the, the building processes so that it is easier instead of more difficult to build low-income housing. So it doesn't have to go through all the planning controls and it doesn't have to. So definitely one of the policies has to look into how do you make the process of building low-income housing from the planning perspective easier? Uh, what can you, uh, so that it doesn't take, you know, one year to go through all these different controls because every, developer will tell you that this this is money. I mean, the more that the time is money in the development community. Yes? So, one thing that I started to notice is that in environmental impact reports, uh, developers don't seem to consider people who are not housed or homeless mm -hmm. as being The onus, you're right, and I think the onus on this should be the public sector's onus too. Because the developers have no, um, I mean, it's not to their benefit to include all, all the homeless people. It should be a much better, uh, you know, oversight from the public sector. And so there is something, I know all these environmental impact reports are supposed to be happening from, and from the development point of view, I think that the developer should pay for these environmental impact reports, but it should be more neutral, personally, if you ask me. It should, it should come from outside the person who wants to develop. It should, there could be an office, a uh, public sector office or something that is funded by development fees, but we need a more uh, neutral assessment of you know, the exact impacts. Okay, I think we're going to stop with questions for now. If you have more questions, we're going to have a panel later, and you'll have the opportunity to go up and ask all of our speakers at once. Um, so can we just give Dr. Suderes another round of applause? And so we're going to have a brief break um, until 10 o'clock, and then we're going to start our next session in room 148. So if you just go back out the doors to the left where we came from, you'll see signs, um, and I'll be standing out there to direct you also.